Hi, students. Okay, farce is one of the most difficult things, I think, to explain exactly what it is. However, once you've seen enough farces, they all look exactly the same on some level. So once you get good at identifying one or two of them, well, you can identify any of them in a lineup. So they generally feature absurd, ridiculous, non-realistic characters, people who you'd never meet in real life. No people are like these people. You've never met people quite like them, who get involved in situations that are so ridiculous, so improbable, with a million of like plot twists that just would never happen in real life. They just are contrived, like it just so happened that he happened to get there in the nick of time to save the baby from the fire so that that way he could um, marry the girl who was in love with him but will only marry him if he can save a baby from a fire. Something ridiculous like that, where it's just what are you even talking about? But it's really funny on stage. So they often use it in plays and in film. And a lot of times it makes fun of ridiculous, super rich people. who are like, oh, I'm so rich. I'm so wealthy. Oh, no one talks that way, right? Well, in farces, they do. Here are some modern day examples of farces before I show you an old fashioned one that's a huge classic. We start with Ferris Bueller's Day Off. It's about a guy who uh, skipping school. Uh, borrows his friend's dad's sports car, they take it off on a joyride, and meanwhile his principal just really wants to track him down and stop him from having this fun day off, you know, like principals do because they're not busy or anything. Well, this principal is apparently not busy enough, um, so he goes and tracks him down and tries to chase him all over the city of Chicago to try to catch him skipping school. Uh, it ends in a, such a way where, well, I don't want to spoil it for you because it's worth your time if you go see it, go see it. It's not at the movie theater. You'd have to rent it. Anyway, it Rat Race and Clue are also like this in that you have a lot of crazy people coming together um, in one room, especially with Clue. It's, you know, a whodunit. We've got Miss Scarlet, um, Miss Peacock, Colonel Mustard, and all those people. And we're trying to figure out who killed so-and-so with Mr. Body with the lead pipe in the ballroom. So they come up with more and more contrived, ridiculous ways that so-and-so knew somebody else, and that's why they're the murderer, and um, none of the people are very realistic at all. Just like in Scooby-Doo, that whole, I would have gotten away with it if it weren't for you kids. Um, what villain ever says that ever in real life? I can't think of a single person who got dragged off by the cops and says that. But it works in Scooby-Doo, because that's what we've come to expect. It's what we've come to expect with this um, over-the-top kind of thing. South Park is also that way. We have these kids getting in bizarre situations that, frankly, no kids end up getting into. Uh, but these kids do for some reason, and all of the adults are thoroughly ridiculous and not very trustworthy people. So if we look at the importance of being earnest by Oscar Wilde, which is a classic, probably one of the most important works in the genre, we have a pun here with the title. Uh, on the first level, it's the importance of being earnest, like as in being honest. But it's also a man's name. So the entire play kind of hinges on the idea that these two ladies would like to get married, but only to a man named Ernest. So it's really important that the guys who want to marry them are named Ernest. Yeah, that's the entire plot kind of revolves around it. I'm going to oversimplify probably a little bit there. But here's the gist of what goes on in that play. So we have this guy. His name is Jack Worthing. Um, and he's a rather wealthy guy who was uh, actually adopted as a baby by a, a rich gentleman fortunate for him, played by Colin Firth, and uh, he's he got to act a certain way as a, as a rich guy, uh, being respectable and stuff. So he's invented this alter ego for himself called Ernest Worthing, and he's claimed it's his brother. And he claims Ernest does all these wild, crazy things when he's in the city, like gambling and drinking and naughtying and other naughty, naughty things or whatever naughty people did in the 1890s in Victorian England. So um, anyway, unbeknownst to all of us, Ernest is not really his brother. It's him. So he likes to go to the city and, um, you know, act like a crazy bachelor. And uh, while he's hanging out in the city, he actually, actually, wait a minute, hold off on the city just for a moment. I forgot to tell you about Cecily. Cecily is played by Reese Witherspoon. It just so happens that the guy who adopted um, Colin first character, Jack, Jack Worthing, um, He's the grandfather of Reese Witherspoon's character. Grandpa went and passed away, 
And so now poor Cecily has nobody to take care of her. So now she's living with Mr. Worthing at his house because she's a minor. Um, and so he's kind of like her dad. There's no relationship connection like in terms of romance between these two. This is kind of important later. Um, and she just knows him as Uncle Jack. Now being, uh, going on to being in the city. So uh, this is Jack's best friend. His name is Algernon Moncrief. He goes by Algy. Now, while Jack is living in the city, he goes by Ernest all the time. And Jack only knows him as Ernest. He doesn't know that his name is Jack. Well, he doesn't know yet, anyway. So he thinks he's Ernest. And it just so happens that Algy has this cousin, Gwendolyn. And again, Gwendolyn thinks Jack's name is Ernest because that's all he's ever gone by is this nickname when he's in town. Jack really, really, really wants to marry her, but Gwendolyn will only marry somebody if his name really is Ernest. So you can imagine that when she finds out his name is Jack, there could be some problems. Now you can see already Gwendolyn's not a terribly realistic character, right? What woman would actually go, well, I've always wanted to marry a guy named Bill. If your name's not Bill, it's not going to work for me. But it does in this play, right? Because we're showing just how ridiculous these rich people are. So as you can see with uh, Algy with his hand over his mouth there, whoops, um, plot twist comes pretty quickly early on. Um, Algy finds Jack's cigarette case, and it's inscribed to Uncle Jack from Little Cecily. Now Algy's saying, hold on a minute, Ernest, are you two-timing Gwendolyn? Because if you're going to be like treating my cousin that way, I don't appreciate it. And that's when um, he has to come clean and go, okay, all right, my name's really Jack, and I live in the country. Um, yeah, I've got this ward named Cecily, and by the way, she looks like Reese Weatherspoon. And uh, when Algy hears that, um, this is the first thought that comes into his head. So Jack goes back to his country mansion to go hang out with Cecily and, and, and to eventually meet Gwendolyn's mom because he, he really would like to marry her. And uh, Algy shows up pretending to be that brother Ernest. So after telling all these tales about how amazing Ernest is and how like you know wild and naughty he is, Cecily has fallen in love with this fake version of Ernest, this man who does not even exist, to the point where um, she's actually started writing in her diary about this guy who's not real. Um, and so in this clip from the movie I'm going to show you, um, she starts talking to Ernest as if he were, well, real as if she'd known him her whole life, even though she really hasn't just, I mean, she just met him. I only care for you. I love you, Cecily. Will you marry me, Cecily, will you? Of course. Why, we have been engaged for the last three months. And he's like, what are the you last talking three about? Months. Yes, it will be exactly three months on Thursday. <laughs> Darling. <laughs> so, when was the engagement actually settled? <laughs> on the 14th of February last. After a long struggle with myself, I accepted you under this dear old tree here. Mm. And this is the box in which I keep all your dear letters. My letters? <laughs> But my own sweet Cecily, I have never written you any letters. You need hardly remind me of that, Ernest. I remember only too well that I was forced to write your letters for you. I wrote always three times a week and sometimes oftener. Do let me look at them. Oh, no. I couldn't possibly. They would make you far too conceited. The three you wrote me after I had broken off the engagement are so beautiful and so badly spelled. Even now, I can hardly read them without crying a little. Was our engagement ever broken off? Yes, of course it was. Mm. On the 22nd of last March. You can see the entry if you like. So this continues Today this I way for a little bit. He's totally well, absurd so about this because she's made him? all no, this no, up. Says, she's I'm never sure met him before. And um, so this is crazy to him well, too. And um, no, she's so not so supposed so to seem like she's a sensible, regular kind of girl. So she's, she's living in a fantasy world that's crazy. You dear romantic boy. Notice how fast he forgives her for this crazy weird, oh. And then she imagines 
like she's in one of those old Renaissance paintings during the Victorian period that were so popular. Is he in a suit of armor? Where did these angels come from? <laughs> Notice how he reacts to it. Yeah. This is kind of weird. I really thought of myself as a man kind until now. You mustn't break it off again, Cecily. Well, I don't think I could break it off. <laughs> Besides, of course, there is the question of your name. Yes, of course. You mustn't laugh at me, darling, but it has always been a girlish dream of mine to love someone whose name is Ernest. Hmm. There's something in that name that seems to inspire absolute confidence. <laughs> So with that scene, we can see just kind of how ridiculous and goofy things get um, with her and her crazy diary and imagining that they've been in love before just because his name is Ernest, which of course we know um, his name is not Ernest, it's Algernon. So he's going to be in a bit of a pickle trying to figure out how to make it so his name really can be Ernest so he can get the girl. Now later on also in this, um, Cecily and Gwendolyn actually meet up for the first time and they don't know that the other one exists and they both believe um, that they're engaged to a man named Ernest. So watch what happens when they actually meet each other for the first time. Right, let me introduce myself to you. My name is Cecily Cardew. Cecily Cardew. What a very sweet name. Something tells me we're going to be great friends. I like you already more than I can say, and my first impressions of people are never wrong. Watch how she smokes this cigarette. <coughs> You're here on a short visit, I suppose. Oh, no, I live here. Really? Your mother, no doubt, or some female relative of advanced years resides here also. Oh, no, I have no mother, nor, in fact, any relations. Indeed. My dear guardian has the arduous task of looking after me. Your guardian? Yes, I'm Mr. Worthing's ward. Oh. It is strange, he never mentioned it. How secretive of him. <laughs> it grows more interesting hourly. But I am bound to state that now that I know you are Mr. Worthing's ward, I cannot help expressing a wish that you were, well, just a little bit older than you seem to be, and not oh, quite jealousy. so very alluring in appearance. Hmm. In fact, if I may speak candidly... Pray do. I think whenever one has anything unpleasant to say, one should always be quite candid. Yes. Well, to speak with perfect candor, Cecily, I wish you were fully 42, and more than usually plain for your age. That was mean. I thought they were best friends. Ernest has a strong, upright nature. He's the very soul of truth and honor. I think, uh, I think Jack, for instance, Jack, I think Jack, for instance, a charming man. Oh, but it is not Mr. Ernest Worthing who's my guardian. It is his brother, his elder brother. Oh, that accounts for it. Suddenly, <laughs> <laughs> you've lifted a load from my mind. I was growing almost anxious. <laughs> of course, you're quite sure it's not Mr. Ernest Worthing who is your guardian. Quite sure. In fact, I am going to be his. I beg your pardon? Oh, you did. Mr. Ernest Worthing and I are engaged to be married. Oh. <laughs> My darling Cecily, mm. I think there must be some slight error. Mr. Ernest Worthing is engaged to me. The announcement will appear in the Morning Post on Saturday at the latest. I'm afraid you must be under some misconception. Ernest proposed to me exactly ten minutes ago. Oh, it's very curious, for he asked me to be his wife yesterday afternoon at 5.30. You would care to verify the incident, pray do so. I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read in the train. I'm so sorry, dear Cecily, but I'm afraid I have the prior claim. So, um... This is really depressing and sad for our little heroine, right? Um, and the, the problem, of course, is that they both think that they're talking about the same guy. And in, re in reality, they're talking about different people. It's just that both guys have uh, faked the fact that their names are really not Ernest because the girls really want to marry a guy named Ernest. So um, you can imagine it all ends happily in the end. That's how farces go. Um, but through the most ridiculous avenues possible. Thanks for listening. Hope this explains farce for you.